In an introduction, one can do like the standard thing, so I'll briefly do that. So the standard thing is, you know, Steve Pinker is a uh, Canadian, uh, 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 you know, he's the, the Johnstone family professor at Harvard. Uh, he's one of the leading uh, researchers in, in uh, language and, and uh, linguistics. Um, and, okay, so that's the standard thing. And he's written lots of uh, very important books for us. The, the not, then I should add something personal, which is this, um, that there's this, uh, there's this community of, of academics and scientists around John Brockman and the third culture. And as I understand it, uh, this concept of the third culture, you know, there was the two cultures in the 20th century, the, uh, you know, the literary intellectuals and the, and the hard scientists. And Brockman noticed that there, we were beginning to have in the 90s some new intellectuals who were really doing what the old intellectuals had begun failing to do. We heard, uh, so there was some mention of uh, what was the, the academic gobbledygook of the deconstructionists. When the literary intellectuals went off into Never Never Land and stopped educating us on what it is to be human, there was a gap. And it was especially people like E.O. Wilson and Steve Pinker who were beginning to fill that gap. Because not only is their research interesting, but they are among the best writers we have ever had. They are just so beautiful to read uh, and such, such masters of crafting the English language. And so when I wrote my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, um, I took Steve's writings and, um, um, and Richard Dawkins were my two models for great, great, and Ennio Wilson for great, great science writing. Um, so Steve is just an extraordinary, extraordinary academic. The breadth of what he has studied, the clarity of his thinking, the research that he does to back it up. Um, he is the absolute paragon of, of what an academic should be, and then he combines that with the kind of fearlessness that we've been talking about uh, for the last two days here. What was the, you, the introduction? There was the, what is your dangerous idea, the Brockman volume? Uh, and Steve wrote the introduction to that. And we should all go back, and it, what year was that? It was like five or six years ago? 10 or 12. Oh, t okay, good, yeah. good. So it was 10 or 12 years ago that he wrote that. I don't know if you could write that today and not be l literally murdered, um, but Steve has the guts to do things like that, and he has consistently had the guts. And uh, there are constant vilification uh, um, campaigns against him. There was the absurd thing where you said something uh, about the alt-right. It was a perfectly good academic thing to say, but of course it was taken out of context. And he, I mean, absurd stuff happens to him because he's got the guts to speak clearly about important issues regardless of the consequences. Uh, and so Steve is a hero of mine. He's a hero of almost everybody in this room. Uh, so please welcome Steve Pinker, who will then be interviewed by Nick Gillespie. Thanks so much. Thank you. It's a real honor to be here. And uh, John is one of my heroes, and I have tremendous respect for uh, what he's done in setting up this academy, this meeting, and in um, promoting this cause. Um, the title of, of my talk, which I hope I will make clear, is An Unnecessary Defense of Reason and a Necessary Defense of Universities' Role in Advancing It, or uh, Why We Need Universities to Refine, Teach, and Promote Objective Truth and Disinterested Reason. This was the general theme that, that uh, John invited me to speak on. And the first uh, question that we have to ask uh, in, uh, on this topic is, is this a hopeless aspiration? Is it old-fashioned? Is it uh, so 20th century? Haven't psychologists shown that humans are irrational? And aren't we living in a post-truth era? So those are the objections that I would like to deal with uh, first in, uh, in uh, arguing for this uh, aspiration. So first off, we are not living in a post-truth era. Why, why aren't we? Well, is the statement, we are living in a post-truth era, true? <laughs> if so, it cannot be true. That is, we are still evaluating propositions based on whether they are true. So we are not in a post-truth era. Likewise, uh, why humans are not irrational. Is the statement, humans are irrational, rational? 
If so, it cannot be true, at least if uttered by a human. If this was a pronouncement from an advanced race of space aliens, then maybe we could take it seriously. But otherwise, uh, if humans were really irrational, who specified the benchmark of rationality against which humans don't measure up? And how did they conduct the comparison? This is an argument that uh, was uh, a style of argument that was made most explicitly by the uh, NYU philosopher Thomas Nagel in The Last Word, where he <coughs> uh, made the case that truth, objectivity, and reason are not negotiable. As soon as you are making the case for them or against them, you are making a case and you are implicitly committed to reason. He calls it a Cartesian argument that uh, after the uh, famous cogito ergo sum argument, namely just as the very fact that one might be questioning one's own existence shows that one must exist, the very fact that one is examining the question of rationality shows that one is committed to uh, rationality. Uh, another fancy word for it is a transcendental argument, one that invokes the preconditions for its own uh, existence. And a corollary is that we actually don't defend uh, reason, we don't justify reason, and we certainly do not, as it's sometimes claimed, have a faith in reason. As Nagel puts it, this is one thought too many. Uh, we don't believe in reason, we don't have faith in reason, we use reason. It's the water that, that uh, we swim in. Now this Cartesian argument sounds a little bit like fancy schmancy tricky logic chopping, but it really isn't. It's implicit in the, the very way that we carry on um, discussions. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, that is, as, as long as you're not bribing or threatening your audience, but trying to persuade them, as soon as you uh, provide reasons why you're right, why other people should believe you, that you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. And that is why a defensive reason is unnecessary, perhaps even impossible or self-contradictory. Now, I think we should retire the cliche uh, post-truth uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is that it is based on the, um, the, the fact that uh, some politicians, one in particular, lies a lot. Um, on the other hand, politicians have always lied. Uh, it's uh, sometimes said that in war, truth is the first casualty. I grew up with the expression, the uh, credibility gap. That was uh, big in the 1960s, often applied to uh, Lyndon Johnson. And uh, the... the uh, <coughs> Bending or uh, nullifying of the truth by people in power is, has long been consequential. It is thought to uh, have um, uh, led to the Spanish-American War, the First World War, the Vietnam War, uh, the Iraq War, and uh, we, we've all been reading the papers the last few days uh, and seen what's been happening uh, in the Gulf of Hormuz. Um, people are spreading conspiracy theories and fake news. Again, this really is not a new development, at least not in, um, uh, in, in quality. In a forthcoming book by James Cortada and William Asprey called Fake News Nation, they show that f fake news and conspiracy theories have a long history in our country, indeed in, in, the, in the, uh, the world. Uh, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, the um, forgery by the um, czarist secret police of a worldwide Jewish conspiracy, the basis of many pogroms and lynchings and deadly ethnic riots were the spread of rumors about the perfidy of some uh, minority group. The uh, idea that fake news is displacing uh, truth, well, we should examine the truth of that widespread uh, belief. Uh, Brendan Nyan, a political scientist at the University of Michigan, has d did so in a quantitative analysis of the role of fake news in the 2016 American presidential election. What he found was that fake news was um, uh, took up a minuscule proportion of the um, online communications during the election, far less than 1%. It was mainly received by people whose minds were already made up, uh, and it uh, didn't change uh, probably any minds. And th this um, actually makes sense when you think about it. If you got an, a, an email or a post that said that uh, Hillary Clinton was running a child sex ring out of a Washington pizzeria, 
chances are, unless you already despised Hillary Clinton, your mind would not be changed. But the, real, I, the main reason that we should retire the post-truth cliché is that it's uh, corrosive and, if anything, possibly self-fulfilling. The implication is we may as well give up on reason and truth and just fight their propaganda, lies, and dogma with our propaganda, lies, and dogma. Uh, I think we can do better. Going back to whether uh, Homo sapiens is uh, irrational, there are actually many reasons to uh, believe, and I say this as a cognitive psychologist, that, um, that th this is uh, overblown, that people are not always irrational. Uh, starting with a, a common argument that one often hears from evolutionary, what people think of as evolutionary psychology, that we have uh, lizard brains, that we, our minds are adapted to uh, rapidly detecting danger, a uh, predator in the grass from uh, simple cues, and that people can't be asked to be more cerebral than, uh, than what evolution gave us. Well, as someone who, can, who also knows a thing or two about evolutionary psychology, um, I can, I'm here to tell you that that is uh, not an accurate portrayal of how the human mind evolved. In a, uh, a wonderful uh, paper called The, Co uh, the uh, Cognitive Niche by John Tooby and Irv DeVore, they argue that Homo sapiens um, is, uh, we are not lizards. Uh, what makes us zoologically unusual is that uh, we evolved to prosper by a combination of social cooperation, language, and know-how, in particular that humans everywhere develop mental models of the world that allow us to explain, predict, and uh, control things. Let me be concrete. Let me give you a, a couple, couple of examples. This one comes from Napoleon uh, Shagnon, who spent 30 years with the Yanomamo of the uh, uh, horti uh, hunter horticulturalists of the Amazon rainforest. Let me describe one of the ways in which they um, uh, obtain food. Uh, armadillos live several feet underground in burrows that can run for many yards and have several entries. When the Yanomamo find an active burrow, as determined by the presence around the entry of a cloud of insects found nowhere else, they set about smoking out the armadillo. The best fuel for this purpose is a crusty material from old termite nests, which burns slowly and produces an intense heat and much heavy smoke. A pile of this material is ignited at the entry of the burrow, and the smoke is fanned inside. The other entries are soon detected by the smoke rising from them, and they are sealed with dirt. The men then spread out on hands and knees, holding their ears to the ground to listen for armadillo movements in the burrow. When they hear something, they dig there until they hit the burrow, and with luck, the animal. On one occasion, after the hunters had dug several holes, all unsuccessful, one of them ripped down a large vine, tied a knot in the end of it, and put the knotted end into the entrance. Twirling the vine between his hands, he slowly pushed it into the hole as far as it would go. As his companions put their ears to the ground, he twirled the vine, causing the knot to make a noise, and the spot was marked. He broke off the vine at the burrow entrance, pulled out the piece in the hole, and laid it on the ground along the axis of the burrow. The others dug down at the place where they had heard the knot and found the armadillo on their first attempt, asphyxiated from the smoke. There's an awful lot of rationality that went into that, um, uh, that, that, that sequence of, uh, of hunting. Let me give you another example from uh, uh, halfway across the world. This is from the citizen scientist Louis Liebenberg, who has spent a lot of his life um, studying the uh, use of tracking by the San in the Kalahari Desert. They use it in persistence hunting, whereby they uh, track animals by their uh, spoor. In order, uh, even though animals are much faster than humans, uh, animals, if pursued, will eventually keel over from the uh, heat if the humans can track their whereabouts for long, uh, long enough. So the, the San Liebenberg points out, engage in inference, that is, they form hypotheses from sparse data in tracks and bent twigs and displaced pebbles, uh, often correctly inferring the species, the age, and the condition of the animal, which allows them to predict its movements. Uh, for example, a deep pointed hoof print they infer comes from a, an agile springbok who has to get a good grip. A shallow flat footed ho hoof print comes from a heavy kudu, has to support its weight. But together with inference, they engage in reasoning. That is, they, in trying to figure out <coughs> what the animal was, where it went, they engage in debate. 
They articulate their logic. They defend it against alternatives. And, there's, and Liebenberg observed plenty of skepticism, challenging of authority. A young hunter could challenge the uh, guests of an older hunt, uh, uh, hunter and challenging of dogma. Again, I'll give you a couple of examples. Three trackers. I will not try to reproduce the uh, clicks. Um, Nate, Uase, and Borozau told me that when the monotonous lark sings, it dries out the soil, making the roots good to eat. Afterwards, Nate and Uase told me that Borozau was wrong. It's not the bird that dries out the soul, soil, it's the sun that dries out the soil. The bird is only telling them th that the soil will dry out in the coming months, and that it is the time of the year when the roots are good to eat. Namka, a, tractor, a tracker from Barrie in the central Kalahari, Botswana, told me the myth of how the sun is like an eland, which crosses the sky and is then killed by people who live in the west. The red glow in the sky when the sun goes down is the blood of the eland. After they've eaten it, they throw the shoulder blade across the sky back to the east, where it falls into a pool and grows into a new sun. Sometimes, it is said, you can hear the swishing noise of the shoulder blade flying through the air. After telling me the story in great detail, he told me that he thinks the old people lied because he has never seen the shoulder blade fly through the sky or heard the swishing noise. <laughs> so if anyone tries to <clears throat> excuse irrationality, uh, dogma, uh, repression of alternative opinions by, uh, by saying that's just human nature, that's the way they evolved, I'm here to tell you don't blame the hunter-gatherers. Uh, don't blame our ancestors. Uh, skepticism, dogma, debate are in our nature uh, uh, as much as reacting to uh, the rustle in a grass. Why were truth and rationality selected for? Well, reality is a pretty powerful selection pressure. The armadillo is either the, there or, or not. Uh, as Philip K. Dick put it, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. <laughs> Also, I'm often told, uh, why do you bother to try to persuade people with evidence? People uh, never change their mind when faced with evidence. And I don't think that is an accurate reading of the literature. It, it, uh, it can be true under certain circumstances. But again, appealing to the work of Brendan Nyhan, uh, evidence can change people's minds, even on highly politicized issues, such as whether there has been a, um, uh, a rise in global temperature among people on the right, whether the surge in Iraq worked among uh, members of, uh, of the uh, left, if it is presented in graphs. People really, Nyan showed, really can change their minds. Um, a third reason that people are, we, sh we should stop saying that people are irrational across the board is that many of the demonstrations of human irrationality, brilliant demonstrations from Amos Tversky, Daniel Kahneman, and others, um, turn out to depend on how the information is presented to people and how rationality itself is defined. I won't have time to get into it this afternoon, but Gerd Gigerenzer has shown that many illusions and fallacies can be eliminated if the information is presented to people with the right framing. So given that we do have the capacity to be rational, why are we so often irrational? And there are a, a number of uh, specific reasons. One of them is the Herb Simon's uh, hypothesis of bounded rationality. We can't process an infinite amount of uh, information uh, instantaneously. We're obviously adapted to an environment that, though reality was a uh, uh, potent selection pressure, uh, we did not evolve with the kind of truth-augmenting technologies that we have developed over the millennia and centuries, such as written language, quantitative data sets, scientific method, hyper-specialization, and uh, expertise. Perhaps even more potently, facts and logic can often compromise our self-presentation as effective and benevolent, which social psychologists have shown to be powerful uh, motives. Um, if you want to convey the impression that you are um, uh, uh, infallible and omniscient and um, thoroughly noble in all respects, then truth and rationality can be kind of a nuisance uh, because inevitably there will be facts that show that you are uh, merely mortal. And a lot of uh, denigration of facts and logic are really just attempts to uh, shore up the advertising campaign uh, for, that we all conduct for ourselves, some of us more than others. Beliefs also can be signals of uh, group loyalty, especially improbable beliefs. Um, as John Tubius pointed out, um, it doesn't 
if you try to affirm uh, your common assumptions, common ground with a group, by saying that you believe that rocks fall down instead of up, well, anyone can say that rocks fall down uh, rather than up. On the other hand, if you say that Jesus is uh, three persons and one per uh, God is three persons and, and one person at the same time, or that Hillary Clinton ran a child sex ring out of a Washington pizzeria, uh, then you have shown that you're willing to take risks at the, uh, in order to demonstrate your solidarity with your, your uh, group. This is, I think, an underestimated source of what we think of as irrationality in the public sphere, especially when it comes to politicized scientific issues such as evolution and uh, climate change. The work of Daniel Kahan, which I assume many of you are uh, familiar with, shows that contrary to what most scientists think, a denial of the uh, fact of human evolution or of anthropogenic uh, climate change is not correlated with scientific illiteracy that many people who believe in uh, human-made climate change are out to lunch uh, when it comes to the science. They'll say things like, uh, you know, helium is a greenhouse gas, radon is a greenhouse gas, global warming is caused by a hole in the ozone layer, we can deal with it by cleaning up toxic waste dumps, and they just have a vague sense of, you know, green and natural and unnatural. Uh, and uh, the ability to predict belief in climate change from scientific literacy is pretty much zero. What does predict it, not quite perfectly, but pretty close, uh, is simply political orientation. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny human-made uh, climate change. Kahn points out that there is a perverse rationality of uh, this expressive cognition that is holding beliefs to signal the coalition you belong to, and that is, Unless you're a, uh, one of a small number of movers, shakers, or influencers, your opinion on climate change really doesn't matter. It's really not going to affect the climate. You can think anything you want. However, your opinion on climate change or on evolution or on other issues is going to matter a great deal in terms of how accepted you are in your social circle. For someone in a, uh, a modern university to um, deny that there has been human-made climate change, conversely, for someone in a, um, a more uh, rural uh, uh, Midwestern community to affirm human-made climate change would be kind of social death. Uh, you'd be uh, someone who's just, you know, doesn't get it, who's someone who's just too weird or, um, or uh, disloyal to be accepted in the group. So it is uh, perversely rational for people individually to hold beliefs that their group holds. Now, the problem is that collectively, uh, it may not be so rational. Uh, the, I, I've adapted a term by Kahan, the tragedy of the belief commons, that what might be individually rational for everyone is collectively irrational because the uh, climate itself, the atmosphere, doesn't care how accepted or not you are in your social group. Uh, and you can see how um, this uh, expressive cognition, if locally rational, can lead to uh, nationwide uh, irrationalities. Uh, a related phenomenon is um, what uh, economists sometimes call pluralistic ignorance or a spiral of silence, namely when everyone firmly believes that everyone else believes something, but no one may actually believe it. A classic example being binge drinking in uh, college fraternities, where it turns out that very few uh, fraternity boys actually believe that it's cool to drink until you puke and pass out. But they are questioned individually. They are all convinced that every other fraternity brother believes that, even if none of them actually believe it. Uh, Michael Macy, Damon uh, Santola, and um, I forget Mr. Williams' first name, um, have shown that this is especially true when you have enforcement, when not only uh, are there beliefs that never get challenged, but uh, people believe people in a group feel that not only must they affirm a belief, but they must punish or condemn or denounce those who don't hold it, often out of the equally mistaken belief that they will be denounced if they fail to denounce. They see denunciation as a sign of, uh, of loyalty to the group, um, which can lead to a, a cascade of denunciation uh, that can spiral into the what uh, was called in the 19th century the ex uh, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds like uh, witch, witch hunts and various bubbles and uh, manias. 
which uh, can sometimes be deflated. The, 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 the bubble can be pricked by a little boy saying that the emperor uh, has no clothes. But you've got to be either a, uh, a, 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 a little boy, a, uh, an innocent little boy, or a very brave um, uh, truth teller uh, in order to puncture this uh, inflating bubble of uh, preemptive denunciation. Now, all of this sounds kind of depressing, but there are cognitive and social resources that can make us more rational, that can bring out uh, what we can think of as the rational uh, angels of our nature. And these have been explored by a number of psychologists, Jonathan uh, Barron, uh, Dan Sperber and Hugo Mercier, uh, Steve Sloman and Jason uh, Fernback and, and others. Uh, and they're based crudely on a, uh, another uh, saying from the, uh, uh, the, the coiner of the term, the better are angels of our nature, uh, a wise man who pointed out that you can fool some of the people all of the time, and you can fool all of the people some of the time, <clears throat> but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. That is a principle that can allow us to be collectively more rational than any of us is individually. And the psychologists who've studied the promotion of rationality have noted that there are various tricks and prods and nudges that can uh, make people more rational. One of them is simply uh, calling on someone to articulate their position. It turns out that many people who have firm, fervent opinions on, say, Obamacare, when asked to explain what Obamacare actually is, uh, they, uh, they are dumbstruck. Uh, they actually know very little about it. And simply asking people, so what actually is NAFTA? Uh, they realize that they don't know, uh, and that makes them a little more epistemically uh, humble about their opinions. Uh, having people defend a position uh, against alternatives in front of disinterested bystanders. Having a small group reach some consensus after discussion among themselves. There's another technique that was discovered long ago by uh, rabbis, which is that in a Talmudic dispute at the yeshiva. After you have your yeshiva students uh, arguing their different interpretations, you then force them to switch sides. And they have to make the strongest possible argument for the position that they were just arguing against. There's the general rubric of what Jonathan Barron calls active open-mindedness, the, just the ethic that one ought al always to reconsider one's opinions, to listen to criticism. Um, knowledge of cognitive psychology itself, to be aware of and discount the various cognitive biases and fallacies that psychologists have identified, such as the availability heuristic, the representative heuristic, heuristic confirmation bias, gambler's fallacy, and so on. To, be, to have your feet held to the fire of empirical predictions. And in uh, science, the ideal of adversarial collaboration, that two uh, theorists who have opposite uh, opinions on some issue, get together and come up with some empirical test that a priori they both agree will settle the question. So the co conclusion up to this point uh, can be that humans can be collectively rational, rational if they submit to norms and institutions that engage their rational faculties and sideline their uh, irrationalities. What are some examples? Well, we've, uh, we, we have seen um, progress, thanks to some of them, a free press, a uh, court system, uh, better than trial by ordeal or by uh, forced confession, uh, science when it works, peer review for all its, uh, all its follies, deliberative democracy, checks and balances in a constitutional government. Uh, as James Madison put it, ambition must be made to counter ambition. And Maybe, perhaps, universities, and I, I, will, uh, I will get to that. Now, is this just, a, again, an idealistic aspiration, or can these rationality-promoting institutions actually uh, promote rationality? Well, in many ways, um, they are, and uh, I'm going to say something that at first will sound shocking, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm uh, going to uh, spell out why I think it's true, that there are many ways in which rationality is increasing compared to just, say, 20 or 25 years ago. Journalism, for example, is supplementing um, uh, you know, shoe, letter, uh, shoe leather and uh, opinionating with fact-checking organizations like PolitiFact, did not exist 25 years ago, and editors say that readers increasingly uh, insist that, uh, that uh, journalists and their editors check politicians' statements against the factual record, something that you did not, would not see several decades ago.
We've seen the rise of data journalism, such as Nate Silver's 538.com, where instead of citing the result of a single opinion poll, which we know simply from sampling considerations can be highly misleading, there are ways of aggregating uh, many polls. Forecasting is no longer a matter of soothsaying or um, relying on the intuitions and gut feelings of experts, but we have prediction markets which combine the principle of the wisdom of crowds with the principle of putting your money where your mouth is. And forecasting tournaments of the kind that uh, Phil Tetlock, uh, one of John Haidt's co-authors, has uh, advanced that there, uh, there are ways of using Bayesian reasoning and active open-mindedness to make uh, quite good predictions about what will happen in the next year. Healthcare has seen the rise of evidence-based medicine. This should have been an, uh, a, a, a tautology, one would think, but, uh, <laughs> but in fact, um, the, the, the uh, um, practice of medicine descended from uh, kind of medieval <laughs> barber surgeons. And the idea that you should only do things to people for which there is evidence that, they, that their uh, benefits outweigh their costs has been something that's only really uh, been taking over the medical profession recently. In policing, we're, living in a, we're meeting now in a city that saw a 75% reduction in its rate of homicide in just eight years, the most astonishing reduction of uh, crime in, uh, in uh, history, despite uh, convictions by many people that violent crime would not disappear until we solve the problems of racist racism and inequality. Well, I don't think we solve the problems of racism and inequality, but New York has still managed to bring its murder rate down by three quarters in eight years. They did it with largely with a system called CompStat, which is basically crunching numbers on where the murders are occurring, capitalizing on the fact that the distribution of violence is highly skewed, follows a, uh, a power law distribution, so that a large proportion of the violence occurs in a tiny number of areas, indeed a tiny number of perpetrators. If you know what they are, come down on them like a ton of bricks. You can bring the murder rate down by a lot. The world of philanthropy and volunteering is, is being um, shaped by the effective altruism movement, which tries to distinguish measures that just cause a warm glow in donors from those that actually improve the lives of the uh, intended beneficiaries. Psychotherapy is moving beyond the, uh, uh, the, the, the couch and the notepad uh, and uh, starting to use feedback-informed treatment where the uh, Coping and mental health of patients are tracked day by day to see which therapeutic interventions are actually helping them or hurting them. Government is starting to, uh, many governments are starting to um, uh, use evidence-based policy, that is not to base policy on their own convictions on what will work, but actually measure if the uh, streets are safer, if, uh, if, if uh, more kids are going to school. And behavioral insights. Um, uh, sometimes called the nudge movement after the book by Richard Thaler and Cass uh, Sunstein, which uses subtle manipulations to get people to do what's in their own interests. Sports has seen the uh, phenomenon of Moneyball, where uh, smarter teams can beat uh, richer teams by processing data instead of relying on uh, hot stove speculation. Uh, online discussion has seen the rise of the rationality community, a site such as Less Wrong and Slate Star Codex, which uh, live by the credo of being aware of cognitive biases and trying to circumvent them. Data has been, have been available uh, on scales uh, that are unprecedented thanks to open source data sets and new methods of data graphics uh, made available in sites like Our World in Data, Gapminder, and Human Progress. For that matter, even everyday fact checking, just settling barroom disputes has been uh, revolutionized by uh, the urban legend uh, tracking site Snopes.com, and for that matter, by Wikipedia, 80 times the size of Britannica, and a number of studies shown about the same level of accuracy. There was a, a cartoon that I um, uh, saw a couple of years ago. Uh, the caption it showed two guys uh, at a bar. The caption was, Life Before Google. And one of them says, I wonder who played the skipper on uh, Gilligan's Island? And the other one says, I guess we'll never know. <laughs> However, all is not uh, bright. There are arenas in which rationality is decreasing, the most conspicuous of which is electoral politics, which is an arena that's all, almost perversely set up to inhibit uh, ra rationality. 
uh, voters act on issues that don't affect them personally, but they vote as if rooting for sports teams. There's no requirement that they inform themselves or defend their positions. Practical issues like uh, energy and, uh, and uh, health care are bundled together with symbolic hot buttons like euthanasia and the teaching of evolution. These bundles are then uh, strapped to uh, regional, ethnic, or religious coalitions, so uh, encouraging uh, um, group expressive uh, uh, cognition. And the media, uh, by treating politics as in the proverbial horse race, encourage a kind of zero-sum competition rather than clarification of uh, issues. So the way I like to think about it is we're living in an era of rationality inequality. That at the high end, we've never been more rational. Uh, but at the low end, um, there's a lot of reason for concern. So there are institutions that bring out what I think of as the rational angels of our nature, and um, others, uh, well, that, that would be, that's an interesting question. Particularly when it pertains to the institution that all of us are here to ponder, namely uh, universities. Now, universities ought to be the premier institutions of rationality promotion. Uh, that's kind of what they're in the business of doing, one might think. That's their essential mission. And they are granted a number of uh, perquisites and privileges that are um, <clears throat> in exchange for fulfilling the mission to, uh, to add to the stock of human knowledge and to uh, transmit it. There's government subsidization of entire universities when it comes to the state systems and to research and uh, scholarships when it comes even to private ones. Private ones have tax-exempt status. There's the extraordinary institution of uh, tenure, which uh, the idea is not to make it easy to become dead wood, but to allow uh, uh, certain kinds of professional intellectuals to express heterodox opinions without fear of being fired. There's uh, exorbitant and uh, hyperinflating tuition. We know that tuition has increased uh, far faster than the rate of inflation for uh, decades. And uh, to send a, 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 a student to an institution like my own, Harvard, costs now close to $300,000. Uh, uh, after a house, the most expensive thing that, uh, that, that people have to uh, absorb. And we... Um, uh, we have given universities an enormous role in uh, credentialing and gatekeeping in the world of uh, business and the professions, where a uh, bachelor's degree is often a, a ticket or a, a prerequisite. Um, dubiously, when it comes to the actual qualifications for the, for the job, studies that actually test how much knowledge people acquire after four years at a university are not a pretty sight. Uh, it is actually rather depressing, and I, I say this as a university pr professor, to see the results of, uh, of um, uh, uh, exit surveys of what students actually know compared to what they came in with. And cynics have uh, suggested that really the, that the reason that um, universities are allowed to credential people is that, in effect, the, um, they are proof that someone has just the cognitive capacity to make it through university if they've acquired the degree and the um, self-discipline. So, um, I mean, one way of thinking about it is that a modern university is a quarter of a million dollar uh, IQ and marshmallow test. <laughs> now, admittedly, that's a, a cynical view, and let, let's hope that that, is, uh, that it doesn't come down to that. So, are universities fulfilling their mandate to promote rationality? Well, I'm not going to go over the uh, evidence. I think many people in this room have um, evidence that at least uh, leads us to question the extent to which they have been. Um, so let me start just by putting it into some perspective. Um, I have uh, written two books that are largely driven by the observation of Franklin Pierce Adams that the best explanation for the good old days is a bad memory. <laughs> so um, I'm, as, as someone who went to uh, university in the 1970s, uh, one, of my, my first, one of my first experiences as a, um, in, in a college freshman in 1972 was seeing the... Um, card table set up in the lobby of my college by the, I forget whether it was the Socialist Democratic Marxist Leninist Union or the Leninist Marxist Democratic Socialist <laughs> Union. But a student uh, was challenging them as they were handing, handing out uh, papers, uh, their, their newspaper adorned with uh, Marx, Lenin, Stalin, um, Mao. 
Uh, and I'm, I distinctly remember yelling out, fascists don't have the right to speak. Um, so this is not new. Uh, orthodoxy, intolerance, repression of non-leftist ideas are not an in innovation of the millennials or the Gen, uh, Gen Zs. And in, there are many examples in the 70s and the 80s of um, behavioral scientists, including Arthur Jensen, Hans Eysenck, Richard Herrnstein, Thomas Bouchard, Linda Gottfriedson, being deplatformed, disinvited, uh, heckled, shouted down, and in some cases physically assaulted. Just to give you a little souvenir from this uh, era, here's a poster from 1984. Come in here, Edward O. Wilson, uh, who John uh, uh, noted in his introduction, sociobiologist and the prophet of right-wing patriarchy. And then at the bottom uh, of the poster, it says, bring noisemakers. <laughs> so uh, it is not new, although um, I don't doubt that uh, it has been getting worse. So by, by, by saying that, that uh, this occurred when, when I was a student, it doesn't mean that we should be unconcerned or that nothing has changed. So why do universities fall short of what one might think of as their essential mission of promoting rationality. There are a number of hypotheses, and I think probably all of them are true to various extents. Um, John Haidt and Greg Lukianoff have suggested, if I can sort of sum summarize it in four words, helicopter boomers gave rise to snowflake millennials. Uh, they, the, uh, or maybe Gen Zers, yes, in, in fact, because they're the, the, the millennials themselves are parents now, yes, hel helicopter uh, millennials. There may, there may be an increase in homophily, people, um, uh, being with people who are like them and the resulting tribalism of uh, belief and opinion within universities. Uh, Bradley Campbell and Jason Manning have um, come up with a, a, an interesting hypothesis. I know that John has, uh, um, uh, uh, has called attention to it, called the culture of victimhood, a sociological development in which uh, individuals' esteem, their, their, the regard in which they're held, are no longer depend on their uh, ability to retaliate against insults with violence, the so-called culture of honor, nor to their ability to control their emotions and, and uh, undergo and, and exercise self-discipline, as in the culture of dignity. But in the culture of victimhood, status and prestige comes with a claim to have been victimized, often uh, ratified and um, enforced by a uh, grievance bureaucracy in universities, an expanding uh, cadre of professionals who working in, uh, many of them, I must uh, say, are really more from the boomer generation, uh, that work in cahoots with uh, students to reinforce this uh, claim to esteem and status by assuming victimhood um, uh, uh, status. And uh, we're seeing spirals of preemptive denunciation and pluralistic ignorance, where it's really an open question how many uh, students really believe in, these, in, in the, the outrage and the victimhood or whether they um, believe that uh, everyone else believes it, uh, enforced by denunciation if they fail uh, to denounce. But I, I sometimes, I don't, this is a pure conjecture. But I do sometimes get the feeling that, that students feel uh, intimidated, and that many of them in private would uh, disavow some of the, uh, the dogma and illiberalism that the noisier ones uh, promulgate. Uh, indeed, some of this is a paradoxical byproduct of progress in uh, equality. Uh, very few people actually are, at least very few people in universities, are uh, genuinely racist, sexist, sexist, homophobic, or transphobic. Virtually everyone believes these are bad things, and that means that accusations of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia are, are, uh, can be weaponized. Uh, there's no one who defends them. That means that everyone is um, the, uh, vulnerable to being accused and probably the only convincing way of defending yourself since there's virtually nothing that you can say if you're accused of being a racist. You say, well, some of my best friends are, you know, I mean, that's just not going to work. <laughs> However, uh, if you are denouncing others, then that removes any cloud of suspicion that you yourself are, are a racist and that can lead to these spirals of denunciation. So should we care? Should, should, uh, uh, should everyone care? It's sometimes said that academic disputes are fierce because the stakes are so small. Um, but uh, no one knows who said it first, by the way. I, did the, uh, I should have added that, actually, to the rationality promoting tech, um, uh, technologies that you can actually 
thanks to Quote Investigator and a couple of other sites, uh, you don't have to attribute every quote to Mark Twain, Winston Churchill, and Woody Allen. Uh, uh, you can actually track down and, and um, uh, be aware that most people uh, didn't say the things that they said, as Yogi, Bear, Yogi Berra may or may not have said. Uh, but in fact, the stakes are not so small when it comes to uh, what's happening at the university. One of them is simply uh, whether universities are carrying out their fiduciary duty uh, to sound education and research uh, that they, uh, for which they are absorbing massive amounts of uh, money and time and attention. The other is their influence on the rest of society. As Andrew Sullivan said in an article last year, we are all on campus now. And the various follies of uh, political correctness and social justice warfare have uh, spread uh, beyond the ivory tower and may be found in uh, tech, in business, in uh, healthcare, and elsewhere. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, d mention two other hazards of the current climate of, uh, of intolerance and irrationality on campus. One of them is that universities are um, losing the battle to secure the credibility of their own uh, research. That when it comes to issues uh, such as climate change or uh, gun violence, there are many um, uh, skeptics, uh, generally on the right, who say, well, I, I, you say that, that uh, scientists, climate scientists are virtually unanimous, that uh, humans have been uh, causing perhaps dangerous levels of climate change, but that comes out of a university. Everyone knows that universities are just echo chambers of uh, dogma and uh, ideological policing. Why should I believe what comes out of a climate science department at a university, given uh, the follies that we all read about? Um, the uh, other uh, danger of allowing universities to, to fester in intolerance and uh, dogma and repression is that uh, it can lead to perverse backlashes. Uh, that in, in many ways, the regressive left is an incubator of the alt-right. And I have seen this happen, including to my uh, shock and some of my own former students, that when they uh, see certain opinions being just unexpressible, when they see student uh, speakers being uh, deplatformed, people being um, assaulted, um, demonized, um, a natural conclusion is you can't handle the truth. That there must be hidden truths that university that are just too uncomfortable to be voiced or discussed in universities, and as a result, the the uh, only option is simply to withdraw into an alternative universe of understanding. And since that alternative universe can have the uh, opposite of the current dogmas, but without any of the qualifications, uh, nuances, counter evidence uh, context, can often um, uh, metastasize in, in rather uh, destructive forms. And I'll just give you some examples. Uh, it is not quite undiscussable, but at least difficult to acknowledge um, sex differences in um, many uh, uh, universities. Nonetheless, um, you know, we're all you know, men or women or, or uh, people who notice our contrasts between those who defend, define themselves as men and women. We, we deal with them. We can't help but notice that men and women are not indistinguishable. What do people uh, conclude who aren't willing to kind of drink the Kool-Aid that uh, that men and women are indistinguishable. Well, the, if it's taboo, they can often lead to um, categorical understanding. Men are this way, women are that way, often quite um, insulting uh, to women. Uh, if you just li listen to a speech by Milo Yiannopoulos, and there's some rather uh, hair-raising examples. Uh, perhaps just performance, uh, but perhaps a reaction to the uh, denial of any sex difference on campus. Whereas if sex differences were discussed openly and in a uh, proper uh, intellectual context, then they can be presented as they are in reality, namely uh, hugely overlapping statistical differences when the sex differences uh, exist, so that in any trait in which women are better than men, there'll be many individual men that are better than the average woman and uh, vice versa, and differences that go in both directions. It's not such a flattering picture to men if you look at the literature on sex differences. Uh, racial differences. Uh, since uh, the the uh, sociologists all know that if you take any social variable and you subdivide it by ethnicity and race, the means are never identical. They just never are. Uh, the, the reasons in the vast majority of cases, probably perhaps all of the cases, are because of cultural uh, differences. But because, as um, the, the story of Amy Wax at UPenn makes clear, 
uh, discussing cultural explanations for racial differences is almost as radioactive as discussing uh, biological differences. Um, and the result is that uh, observers of the uh, squelching of uh, analysis of ethnic and racial differences, looking at what happened to, uh, say, Amy Wax for even bringing up the possibility of cultural differences, will say, well, there must be a repression of uh, big and uh, negative racial, uh, biological differences between the races, something that could have been uh, preempted if the full range of hypotheses were uh, examined. And I'll, uh, a third example is uh, the fact that uh, it's almost impossible to hear anything um, uh, good about capitalism on an American campus, even though, again, uh, if you are not in that bubble, uh, there's plenty of evidence that capitalism brings more uh, advantages than disadvantages. Would you rather live in uh, South Korea or North Korea? Uh, would you rather live in uh, Chile or Venezuela, in the former East Germany or the former West Germany? Now, these are obvious facts, but if uh, saying something like that, quite obvious, is close to taboo, then people who do look around the world and see what's happening will uh, extricate themselves from that whole arena and come to uh, conclusions that are far more extreme than a, an open uh, discussion would, uh, would lead to, a form of anarcho-capitalism or plutocratic capitalism in which there can be no uh, social safety net, no regulations, even the slightest uh, uh, provision of health care would be a slippery slope toward uh, Mao and Stalin. Uh, the reality being that there is no such thing as a developed capitalist country without extensive regulation and a social safety net, so we're not even talking about reality when uh, we, we uh, talk about uh, a unfettered, untrammeled um, uh, total free market capitalism. If that fact were better known, that capitalism both brings advantages and in reality always is accompanied by regulation and a social safety net, we'd probably have more intelligent discussions on, on uh, all sides. So to sum up, I've suggested that we, uh, we must safeguard the truth and rationality promoting mission of universities. It's feasible because we are not living in a post-truth era and humans are not always irrational. The rational angels of our nature must be encouraged by truth-promoting norms and institutions. Many are succeeding, despite uh, perhaps growing rationality inequality. Universities may be falling short of their rationality-promoting mission. This mi mission nonetheless matters for society to enjoy the benefits of rationality in return for the perquisites it grants to universities, to secure the credibility of university-based research on vital issues, and to prevent backlashes of irrationality. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Hi, uh, everybody. I'm Nick Gillespie. I'm editor-at-large at Reason. Uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, coming out. And I want to thank Deb and John for a fantastic uh, uh, conference. So let's give them a round of applause. I, uh, I, 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 I hope I hope I plugged the name of your magazine. Enough. Yeah, well, you know, it, it gets around. We, uh, truth was, you know, it seemed a little bit arch, so <laughs> yeah. reason is good. And I want to also thank Steve, as, uh, as John made clear, as a Canadian, and it's kind of, he's one of those immigrants who's doing a job that Americans won't do, <laughs> which I think is defending rationality and enlightenment values, so thank you for that. You're almost, almost your spiritual Mexican in that sense, right? Um, so I want to ask, a, uh, start off, and I'll, I'll ask a couple of questions and I'll turn it over to you guys, but what is the source of post-truth or truthiness in the university? Because, you know, we're, we're talking, this is an organization that's about the academy, um, and there's a lot of reasons for, you know, things happening outside, but where, what is the, you know, kind of the uh, wellspring of this in the university? Well, I, I mentioned a, a number of hypotheses, and I really, I can't yeah. claim to know the answer, but... Um, there's the one that John and Greg have, uh, have noticed. There may be generational differences in, in uh, students. Um, the, uh, I, I suspect that the, the, the uh, success of um, the, the uh, drive for, for equality and, and inclusion, the fact that very few people really are racists, in, especially in, in uh, universities, and there are data that back this up. In fact, fewer and fewer people are racist in the country as a, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Again, this is bizarrely, 
this is often considered a, um, a, a reactionary thing to say, uh, right. but the, uh, not only are overt racist opinions in pretty steady mm -hmm. decline, that is the number of people who will say either you know, blacks and whites should go to se separate schools, or if a black family moved in uh, next door, I would move out, or uh, pejorative opinions like the reason for inequality is that, that um, blacks are less intelligent or, or uh, less hardworking. Mm -hmm. Those have been going down, down, down. Some of them are now in the range of crank opinion. Right. Like, uh, um, but also um, more subtle, uh, uh, measures of implicit racism. Um, I, I reported in Enlightenment Now with the help of Seth Stevens Davidowitz the uh, result of Google searches that people can do in uh, private. How many people search for racist jokes? How many right. find them funny? That's been going way down. And my colleague Mazarin Benaji, looking at uh, two decades of her own research on uh, implicit bias from the implicit association test, has shown that even unconscious bias has gone down. So we all agree racism is bad and sexism and so on. But that does um, provide a, a kind of an incentive for um, competitive uh, status seeking of, um, for, for, for uh, uh, who has the brighter halo by using it as a, an effective um, weapon of, of mass destruction, accusations of racism. Let me, let me uh, uh, be more uh, forceful, I guess, or, or, or direct. What is the role, and, and John made a joke about uh, deconstruction and gobbledygook uh, yesterday, one of the speakers said, I, I will tell you, I got my literature PhD at the high water mark of theory, and I consider myself a postmodernist. Capital T theory. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but is that is that part of the problem? The uh, the rise uh, throughout the seventies, uh, the sixties and seventies, and into the eighties and nineties, of a uh, set of theories or a set of ideas that said that truth is absolutely socially constructed, yes. uh, and that it, it reflects power. I mean, how how important is that to the discussion that we're having there? And then also saying then all viewpoints are essentially equally false, and everything becomes a kind of will to power. Yes, on right. campus. So how, so how is, is that? So is that part of what's our, our work? Our, did Kellyanne Conway take too many courses in French literary theory? <laughs> or Sarah, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, our, mm -hmm. our yeah. most prominent exponent of, uh, of, uh, of um, Foucault and Lacan? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, uh, liter literally unlike, or Donald Trump yeah. for that matter, who's, yeah. uh, who, who really does, uh, if, if you change the wording, it really could sound like uh, a lot of postmodernism. I, 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 I don't think that it's, uh, there's a direct chain of influence, but what it has done is left universities defenseless in, uh, in counteracting it. That, well, what, is, what, it, is it coming within the university? I mean, one of the arguments about political correctness when it started becoming a thing, it was that it was something that the right wing imposed. Like, it, you know, they, it, it was almost like they were uh, saying that people in the universities were acting like witches. It was, it was something uh, kind of forced on the university, but isn't it true? I mean, that it's it's not the people who are questioning truth at Harvard are in Harvard departments, and they're in certain types of disciplines and things like that. So, I mean, are right. they the ones who are saying no? The university is not a place for truth because truth doesn't exist. It's actually a way of, you know, some some of them are, uh, and I say this from first person experience. That in fact, my statement of the mission of the universities is not actually stated as the mission of the universities by the universities. Right. It's actually very hard to pin down administrators or uh, professors to make statements along the lines that I just did. So I actually was being somewhat presumptuous. Uh, I was part of the curriculum review at Harvard about uh, 15 years ago. And, and, and for bizarre reasons, the, whole, the world pays a lot of attention to Harvard. And so the curriculum reform at Harvard got a lot of uh, press outside the walls. And so to start off is, well, what, what's the point of education? And a lot of my colleagues would say things like, well, I see college education as, as soul craft, as building a self. And you know, frankly, I don't know how to build a self. Uh, I don't know how to develop soul craft. So you know, maybe, maybe, thank, God, thank goodness I have tenure, because I can actually say that and I won't, don't, won't get fired. I think I do know how to teach you know, linguistics and cognitive science. and uh, but. Um, so it is true that universities haven't, despite what I, the, the words that I think I put into my colleagues' mouths, uh, have not really dedicated themselves to, to that, probably partly because of the influence of, uh, I think, of postmodernist thinking. And isn't the motto of Harvard is veritas, right? Yeah, it is so indeed. It's got something about truth. One would think. But, but that, that's actually, 
uh, is, I mean, so maybe you, we, if we're interested in the, in the vision of the university that uh, Steve put forward, which I, I know I am, is that that's actually an argument that needs to be won, that the it university is, is a true. place of production of truthful knowledge. Yeah. Uh, because a lot of people would say, no, it's not that, it's something else. Yeah, no, I, I imagine that's right. Um, do you find within the university campus setting, is it, is it professors or is it students who are the fomenters of, you know, a turn away from rational discourse, away from truth or, or, or approaching objective truth? Uh, you know, I think among professors who, are, who, who, are, who obviously have uh, more acquaintance with, um, it's, I think there is some, pl some pluralistic ignorance that I think in private many professors will say things that are completely, um, by our lights, reasonable. That is, uh, uh, acknowledging the value of objecti objectivity, truth, knowledge, all that stuff. Uh, but then when it comes to public arenas, they're all afraid to do it because they're all afraid that they'll, they'll get, they won't be able to defend it if for forced to. Um, I, and among students, um, you know, I, I think that the, uh, there are, again, I, uh, I'm hesitant to say without a, a good sampling of the uh, privately stated opinions of students. And I'm hesitant to generalize from my own experience because I don't know what kind of students gravitate to me that come to my office hours. In general, the, uh, I don't find among the students that I speak to in dinners and office hours have these um, uh, intolerant uh, beliefs. Mm -hmm. But I may, I'm, I may be getting a bias sample or maybe it's a bias sample that are making the headlines. I don't know which of those is, is right. What do you uh, think is the role, and, and Harvard and many uh, kind of research one schools or flagship state schools are in, in different situations than many other universities where there's a sense if you talk to the professoriate, I mean tenure Tenure lines are being shut down, uh, you know, uh, are, are, are in decline compared to where they were a few years ago. How much of this is, uh, or is conceivably, that the the resources are dwindling, so the stakes get higher actually, and then people are fighting not for the future that they might inhabit, but they just want to be able to be the last ones who get to turn the lights off at the university. <laughs> yeah. Um. I don't, it wouldn't, I don't think it would explain the, um, what's coming up from, from, uh, among the students. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect that institutionally, a big factor may be the, uh, the massive expansion of the student life bureaucracy, mm -hmm. of the, the deans at various levels. And we just know from academic economics that they are absorbing a larger and larger proportion of university resources. They're at least partly responsible for the hyperinflation of uh, tuition. Um, it is in their interests to foment as much discontent and outrage as possible. Um, and because universities have a, uh, are, are, are kind of feudalistic in the sense that there are a lot of sort of semi-autonomous fiefs that aren't really responsible to anyone. So the people at the, the top of the academic chain of command, the, for whom the buck stops, the, the presidents, the provosts, Often are, are just kind of are, are, are titular heads of uh, a vast organization that have a number of self-replicating bodies. The, um, the 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 Title IX bureaucracy, the uh, affirmative action bureaucracy, the um, uh, human subjects protection bureaucracy, where they have their own culture that um, spreads beyond the walls of any particular institutions. They're hired from similar positions at other universities. Um, the, it's very, it's convenient for a um, top level administrator like a provost or a dean to hire someone and just um, give them responsibility for running that aspect of the university, it takes them out, it takes out of their hair and it's a, um, a, a thankless job, there's a lot of uh, pain and nuisance and if you could just outsource it to some professional then it makes your life as a provost easier and no one criticizes you for having a, uh, this bureaucracy that, that often runs counter to the mission of a university. So I think there's something more distributed in the structure of the university, in the, in the chain of command. It's not, we don't have the equivalent of the military being under civilian control. Right. Uh, Do you, uh, final question, and then we'll have time for some questions from the audience, yes? Okay, yeah, so, um, what, um, you know, what is a model of, uh, in some of the stuff you were talking about, what, what is a model that faculty can do to show how to settle disputes in a rational uh, uh, kind of way? I mean, uh, 
is and is part of the problem here that in the past and and kind of not in the distant past necessarily either people who spoke with tr about truth with a capital T oftentimes were very inflexible or they were later re revealed to be wrong or to yeah. be kind of fakers or you mentioned Hans Eisen who is just a fascinating character in this where not only did he have a lot of odd beliefs and he started pushing for uh, parapsychology and astrology at the end of his life, but then it was revealed that he took, he was very outspoken that uh, smoking does not cause cancer, and it turned out he was paid by tobacco companies as well. Um, how much of the epistemological humility uh, that we want out of students or out of faculty or out of society needs to be modeled better within the university? Yeah, no, absolutely. And the, uh uh, the, the, the lessons of um, the, the cognitive psychology of the irrationality from Tversky and Kahneman and so on have not widely penetrated even uh, um, in the university. They're starting to because of books like Thinking Fast and Slow and Dan Ariely's Predictably Irrational and, and being picked up by columnists like, like uh, David Brooks and, and others. But still a lot of, um, I think a lot of intellectuals are uh, in, in many fields uh, put too much stock in their own um, sense of personal rectitude and infall fallibility based on just sheer erudition. If, uh, and we know that erudition, among other things, is not a reliable cue to being right. Well, this is my pitch for, for postmodernism. I, I use the uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard's uh, short uh, definition, which is incredulity toward metanarratives. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean we don't use them and need them. But we are always kicking the tires on the car and the model. Well, that's uh, a good thing. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's open it up for uh, some questions. Uh, we have a microphone that's rotating around. OK, so uh, how about the uh, gentleman over there in the shadows? And Thank you for coming. Um, Alex Goodwin, I work at MIT. Uh, I wanted to ask, how can we lower the stakes for confronting? Yep. I think I turned off. Confronting pluralistic ignorance. And if not, if there's no way to lower the stakes on confronting that, as in like what the repercussions for confronting it, how do we stop it and the destructive effects? Well, uh, the, um, the study that I cited by, by Michael Macy and his collaborators, Damon Santola, showed that if there are open channels of communication, if there aren't self-contained um, communities where the interactions are uh, tightly knit, but that there are long distance connections, so that people from outside a community are, uh, their opinions can be sampled rather than just the people you rub shoulders with. Uh, if there is more openness and uh, more little boys uh, uh, pointing out the, the, the uh, uh, state of dress of the emperor, uh, those are ways of, of deflating these, these uh, bubbles. Uh, but another big factor, this goes also to something that, that um, Nick was asking. Um, I think uh, the huge danger in combating the intolerance, the repression, and so on is to uh, make it seem like it's a right-wing issue, because that will only stoke it. That if you're a, uh, a respectable member of the, uh, the the left or even the, the, the non-right, um, then if you will if you re react or recoil from a movement that you see as aligned with, uh, you know, ultimately Donald Trump or the alt-right, then that will just push people. Um, uh, e even uh, farther along to become, make them even more uh, entrenched and resistant. So one, just as with um, climate change, the worst thing that happened to that movement was when uh, it became a left-wing issue, when uh, some people date it to Al Gore uh, producing an inconvenient truth, being a Democratic presidential candidate and former vice president. Uh, he kind of stamped it with, with uh, a left-wing aroma, um, leading to greater polarization. Uh, if that happens to free speech, heterodoxy, um, open inquiry, um, then, then it's going to get worse. Um, over here, uh, front row, sir. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Thank you. I recently, uh, I recently read that uh, mm. yeah. well, I recently read a book by uh, Roger McNamee who had argued that um, that the, the fake news had a huge influence on the election. Um, and you said that it didn't up here, um, that most people didn't pay any attention to that. And I was wondering if you were worried about the influence of it in the next election. Mm -hmm. I'm, so I, I'm, I'm not aware of that book. Maybe afterwards you'll, you'll tell me about it. So this was based, based on work of Brendan Nyan. Uh, it was a paper, not a book. 
Well, I am worried about it just because whenever you have the proliferation of uh, disinformation, it can, can't be a good thing. At best, it can be ineffective, but at worst, it can be per pernicious. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I would worry about it. I think well, obviously the social media companies and, and uh, conventional news organizations ought to combat it. It's not that it's innocuous, but it, it's not as if we should surrender to the idea that it's proliferating so much that the, that the battle is lost. Um, the, by the way, and it isn't, Nyan points out that it isn't that, uh, in general, it's not so easy to shift people's political opinions with, with messages. Even campaign ads don't make a big difference for all the money that gets lavished on them. But there are some things that do have a provable effect, such as um, cable news networks. So Fox News, for example, really does move the needle. And it does push people to the right in a way that, that uh, fake news does not. But anyway, yes, I am. Uh, I think we should be concerned. Yeah. Um, sir, up front, I'm sorry to make uh, the mic holders get a workout here. Steve, you said that it was in the interest of is it was in the interest of bureaucracies to or the bureaucracies to foment disagreement. It, it, maybe that was obvious too, but it wasn't exact. I, I think I see what you mean, but can you expand on that? Well, how is it in their interests to foment discord? Well, it proves the need for more bureaucrats. And in fact, the um, comfortable reply of any um, um, kind of chain of command university administrator, by which I mean deans, provosts, presidents, whenever there's a trouble, they, they hire more staff. If there's a, an accusation of racism, if there's a um, student who is questioned by a police officer and the student is African American and it makes the papers, then the president hires more diversity officers. Um, so when things are blown up, uh, then it, it, it tends to expand the, um, uh, the, 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 the range of these, uh, of these bureaucrats. And each one of them not only gets a salary, but they also get a staff. Uh, they have, they have uh, administrative assistants, they have uh, uh, um, high, higher level assistants. So this can uh, uh, increase the uh, burden and bloat in a university. And because they often don't, re don't really report to someone who uh, has the fiduciary duty to advance the truth enhancing mission of a university, but act pretty much autonomously and are convenient ways of deflecting um, the controversies. Uh, they uh, offer presidents kind of safe passage across the minefield of academic life. Just hire more diversity uh, officers, or um, uh, then uh, uh, there's a, a kind of unstoppable dynamic within the, the structure of a university. Something that there, there probably are people in organizational behavior and uh, the, who study the uh, dynamics of organizations. Uh, who might be able to shed light on what what uh, I see as something of a pathology in the organization of the university. It's counter to the interest of the, of the organization. Can the faculty do stuff about it? So can the faculty do stuff about it? So I mean, this is an interesting question. The faculty, the, the in general, not directly in that it isn't the the faculty don't choose the uh, the dean or the the president. They certainly don't choose, say, the director of admissions or the, the, the various you know, Title IX and diversity and, uh, and other bureaucracies. They can make a nuisance of themselves. Um, and, you know, they, can, they, can, they can make a fuss. They can uh, force presidents to resign if, they, uh, if the president loses the confidence of the faculty, depending actually on how the trustees or the governors or the corporation of the university reacts to them. But uh, it's often quite opaque uh, what the chain of command is in the university. And I know this just from my own experience in the last few days when I uh, wrote to a number of my colleagues at Harvard about the case of Kyle Kashuv. The, um, uh, many of you have probably read about him, the, the, uh, the young man who uh, was a survivor of the Parkland High School uh, shooting and then became a uh, conservative um, uh, advocate of um, uh, gun rights, but also uh, of school safety, not involving gun control. Very intelligent and mature man who was accepted to Harvard. Then, when he was, it was outed that he had contributed to uh, kind of a chat room-like document uh, several years ago, in which he had uh, 
made some uh, used some some racist language. He was uh, his acceptance was withdrawn from from uh, Harvard. And I, you know, I wrote to the president, I wrote to the dean of uh, the Harvard College, I wrote to the director of admissions, and I kind of got a, a bit of a runaround as to who actually could defend this because the president said, well, um, this is up to the director of admissions. Uh, I have a policy of not commenting on it. The director of admissions says, well, I have a policy of not commenting on individual cases. So who actually would, would actually defend this decision? And uh, th there was no one that could be, ident no one was on the hook. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, so maybe he should just show up. Let's let's uh, have one more question. We have time for one more, please. Thank you. Uh, you spoke to why universities should care about rationality. What kind of case do you make to students for why they should care about rationality, especially in a climate where it's not politically or socially rewarded? Yes, well the, well, the same case. I mean, I, I believe that um, my, my policy is always to treat students as as peers to make the same argument that I do to my colleagues uh, as I, um, I do to the students. So I mean, I, I would like to think that the kind of considerations that come up in this discussion would be uh, you know, as pertinent and, pertinent and as um, intelligently received by students as by, uh, by anyone, else, anyone else. Do you, do you think part of the problem here, and I realize you know, we talk about the university, the academy, uh, and you know, there's something like 4,400, I think, four year, two, or four, two and four year schools, very different. But is, is part of this that the university is now focused so much on education? And some people will say it's, you know, no, it's, it, you know, we've taken scholarship too far. But it seems to me over the past 20 or 30 years, the student experience is foregrounded so much. And then if you take it with John uh, and Greg's work, you know, we, we just want to keep the, you know, the middle school or the nursery school element of their childhood alive for four more years. Um, and that we should be focusing more on the university as a, as a place that produces truth, you know, provisional truth for sure. But, and that that's, that's really what's driving a lot of this. Um, it's funny because the argument could go both ways right. because we also have seen arguments that students get neglected, that universities just reward star researchers, that can be you know, bumbling teachers in the classroom. Right. Although that, um, by the way, is a weird linkage too because it's, you know, I, I, I knew a lot of bad researchers who were like, well, I'm a good teacher. And it wasn't <laughs> really that they were a good teacher, it's just they sucked at research. So they're like, well, I've got to be good. And if you're so busy doing research, you can't be a good teacher. But my best teachers, both as an undergrad grad yeah. student, were inevitably people who were really interested in doing good research. Yeah, but no, I, it, I, I, think I, I, I think that is yeah. true. And, and, I, and I, I do believe in the particular bundling of education and research that we see in the American University. I think certainly for all the criticism that I and, and many people in this room level at American University, it is on the whole a fantastically successful institution, one that the envy of, of uh, uh, many other countries. And I think the, the, the bundling of teaching and um, research is one, is one of them. But for one thing, uh, why are we developing all this knowledge? Why are we doing all this research? You know, in a few decades, we're going to be dead. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole value is that it gets transmitted, it gets uh, perpetuated. Uh, and also, we all know, any, any researcher knows that you have an undergraduate as one of your collaborators, and they'll you know, point out problems, they'll suggest hypotheses, they'll, uh, because you know, they're smart people. Uh, they, they know less, but, they, uh, but, but they're smart, and, and that kind of um, diversity of generations, diversity of experience. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not the only professor who learns a lot of tech from students, learns a lot of statistics from, from, uh, from my students. Uh, so, uh, and what many students identify as the most valuable part of their education uh, is working with, uh, with professors on, on, uh, on research. So I think it is a successful model, uh, but it is also true that a lot of the student experience is not necessarily oriented toward that part of the, uh, uh, the portfolio, namely of uh, uh, classes and lab work but of the extracurriculars, which to my shock are enormous, even at, a, at, at um, top echelon brand name universities like Harvard. Uh, I find that the, with the encouragement of the administration, education is just one of many activities at this luxury resort. Uh, it's like they got, 
Yeah, you know, there's there's the just like when you go to a, you know, someone goes to a resort. There's the you know there's there's the sailing and then there's the buffet table and then there's the you know the the, the entertainment. You know, classes are one uh, perk of being at a university, and and for many students, not not the chief one. It's like the. Well, the, we will leave it there. Thank yeah. you so much, Stephen Pickett. Okay. <laughs>